Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. Tonight, loan sharks and other hazards for immigrant entrepreneurs. Gowanus, the stink of success, and life after prison. Plus, get ready to call in tonight on how to maximize Christmas love and minimize Christmas stuff. Do you have one of these? I got a little obsessed with mine. In fact, I got a little obsessed with all my stuff. Have you ever wondered where all the stuff we buy comes from and where it goes when we throw it out? But first, here are this week's online video picks. Number one, here's one thing I did about all that holiday stuff. On my WNYC radio show, I got a credit card exorcism from actor Bill Talon, who inhabits the character Reverend Billy from the Church of Stop Shopping. Now we've just got a few minutes left, and I know that you perform credit card exorcisms, and I want to know how they are done. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, people wave the credit cards in the air in the congregation with the magnetic stripe facing Reverend Billy, and the band um, cranks up a kind of a vortex, a very special, funky gospel uh, sound that actually, I feel it uh, filling me. It, it's the, it's the mother-father creator that isn't trying to sell us anything. And it just comes into my fingertips and, and I, I, I see in those credit cards all the cars and gadgets and plasma screens and what have you that they, they, they still owe money on those cards and 25% to the banks and, and something just happens and we just strip those cards of any existing credit, Brother Brian. And have, you, have you got one here? Uh, I, I've, got, I've, I've got a credit well, card. If you, if you, I, I kind of value it. You don't it, want to spend any more money. Uh, oh, yeah. But this is, this is, uh, I, I, just, I don't know. It's, it's, there it is. Yeah. Oh. You can do it, Brian. We ask, we ask the fabulous unknown, the wacky empresario that has created life, come down through Reverend Billy's fingertips into Brother Brian's magnetic stripe and but, well, wipe but, out any exi existing credit there. <laughs> but Reverend, that card gives me 1% back toward my child's college fund. It's a I will fantasy. pay you that directly out of the church. Ah, oh, that felt good. That exorcism, by the way, is immortalized on WNYC.org. Video pick number two, this online political ad was not approved by Mike Huckabee, who, by the way, is not a Mormon. Not that there's anything wrong with that. If you're a Republican voter in Iowa, Mike Huckabee wants you to know that he just got a voicemail from God saying he knows how busy you are during this blessed Christmas season. You have too much to do to even think about what Mike may have said 15 years ago, or who he may have released and who they may have killed eight years ago, or what he may not have known about a few days ago. All you have to remember is who Mike Huckabee isn't. Mike isn't a corrupt cross-dressing sex addict from pushy New York City whose friends are all indicted or gay. Mike isn't 178 years old, and he didn't sponsor a bill that would send millions of Mexicans into Iowa to steal your job, do the lombada with your daughter, and make your food taste spicy with their jalapenos. Mike isn't made of plastic. He doesn't have the soul of a game show host from the 1970s, and there's nothing magic about Mike Huckabee's underwear. Mike Huckabee, strong conservative, not a crook or a weirdo or a Mormon. Let's leave it at that, okay? Okay, this parody was not approved by Mike Huckabee. Now, let's see, was that for Mike Huckabee or against him? Anyway, that parody of a political ad posted by Stranahan on YouTube. And, you know, there's no reason to confine the attack ad to politicians. So video pick number three is from producers James Giovanna and Carrie Burt. Mr. Kant would have you believe that reality is purely noumenal and beyond the reach of our phenomenal consciousness, thereby being inherently unknowable. Mr. Kant claims that a true deontological ethics is based on a universal maxim that must never consider specificities of circumstance, character, or likely outcome. 
Mr. Kant holds that the aesthetic appeal of this sublime is purely in its awakening in us a sense of our own rational mastery over situational being. Emmanuel Kant. Wrong on metaphysics. Wrong on ethics. Wrong on aesthetics. Wrong for America. Paid for by the committee to elect Friedrich Nietzsche. I am Friedrich Nietzsche and I approve of this message. Hey, you forgot to blame Kant for letting rapists out on parole. Video pick number four. Nice catch for the Obama campaign, really. A former Clinton precinct captain in Iowa defects. Finally to see a woman run. I got involved early on, licking stamps, stuffing envelopes, doing the things that a, a volunteer does, making hundreds of phone calls. I was really surprised to see personal attacks from one Democrat to the other Democrat. And when my husband and I have sat and watched this on TV, we said, what's this campaign coming to? The, the negative stuff, it just does, isn't going to work. It's not going to work here in Iowa. People are really sincerely interested in doing the right thing and listening and making the right decision. And, and I found other people who also have been dissatisfied and have, have made the switch, too. It, it's, there's just a, a disconnect, and I kept seeing this disconnect, and I decided no, no. I'd always liked Barack Obama. It was always difficult to make this decision, but it didn't become difficult anymore. And video pick number five, you know, that old boombox is still good for something at New York's annual Unsilent Night procession this time of year. It was Saturday in Greenwich Village. wonder if passers-by could hear the boomboxes over their iPods. And that's our online video picks for this week. This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. And as if it weren't hard enough to start a successful business in New York, imagine having to deal with language barriers and cultural confusion alongside all that competition. Yet immigrant businesses keep this city working, from street vendors to shop owners like Digna Guzman. Digna Guzman loves being an entrepreneur. Though Dominican, she runs a small Polish deli in Jackson Heights, where she sells everything from kielbasa to pierogies. As a single mother, she needs both the income from her shop and from her night job cleaning offices to make ends meet. She has tried to run a business twice in the past. Both times, the business failed. 
When she started out, Digna went to a loan shark to get the capital she needed. He charged her $280 a week on a $5,000 loan. Yo tomé un dinero prestado de esta persona que cobra semanal, interés semanal. Yo estaba que me estaba poniendo loca con las deudas. After falling behind on payments, she found herself deep in debt. She was unable to get a bank loan because her credit had plummeted. Mi crédito no estaba bien. Y nunca, nunca me detuve a, a sentarme en eso, así, oh, qué tan importante es el crédito. Researcher Jonathan Bull says the practice of going to a loan shark is common. Uh, because so many immigrants that um, have never established a, a credit history, that can't get bank loans, a lot of times they, they go with what they know. And in a lot of communities, the, the best way to get money, to get cash, if you need to start a business or if you need to plug a hole and you know, get cash flow, you go to a, a loan shark uh, charging uh, an arm and a leg of interest. We'll return to Digna Guzman's store in a few minutes. Right now, we are joined by Tanzina Vega, CUNY reporter who created that piece. It's on her website, TanzinaVega.com. She's been taking a long, hard look at the difficulties that many immigrants have with setting up shop in New York. Hi, Tanzina. Welcome Hi, to the Brian. program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What got you interested in this question of loan sharks and immigrant businesses? Well, I think living in New York, I mean, we're so used to seeing immigrant businesses. I don't think a lot of people realize the extent to which we rely on them. And so there have been some research reports that, would, that have been put out by the Center for an Urban Future and the Street Vendor Project. And I started going through them, having reported uh, extensively on urban issues in the city. And as I was reading them, I said, you know, I really want this, I want to hear these stories. I want to hear who they are. I want to see them. It just felt like they, they were stories that needed to be told in this media. You know what it reminds me of? The whole subprime mortgage crisis, which is a whole loan shark with, you know, immigrant or other working class people trying to get into the homeowner business. I guess there's a parallel here with, uh, I mean, the homeowner, not homeowner business, but the homeowner status. Maybe there's a parallel here with people trying to get into owning their own business. Absolutely. I don't think a lot of people realize how challenging it really is. Again, like, like I said earlier, I think we just sort of, we're used to seeing them. We rely on them for food service and all other types of services that, that we use every day from our dry cleaners to our bodegas, but we don't realize the difficulty uh, that it is, how hard it is to actually set up shop in C New York City. Could Digma, Digna Guzman there have gotten a loan at a better rate? Because her story was really outrageous about how in hock she is now to this loan shark. Well, actually, Digna luckily has paid off that loan, and um, one of the challenges is that a lot of immigrants can't find credit, and so what they do is they have to go to loan sharks in their communities. In Spanish, they would call them a prestamista, and normally you're charging anywhere from 5% a week to 25% a month in interest rates. What was the Spanish? Prestamistas. Does that mean uh, literally loan shark? Yeah, that would be the most direct translation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let's watch another part of that same piece with Digna Guzman, more about financing a business. Digna did, however, find the help she needed. Leonid Ostrovsky works for Nyana, a nonprofit organization that specializes in helping immigrant and women-run small businesses in New York. One of the common uh, obstacles uh, across, across the board is uh, lack of understanding of credit history which was not that important in their respective uh, homelands. Uh, we've seized clients that didn't pay too much attention to their debt obligations. Digna was able to secure a microloan through Nyana, which she has since paid off. The experience taught her a valuable lesson. Para tu empezar un negocio, para tu hacer lo que sea en la vida que tenga que ver con dinero, tiene que tener un buen crédito. As for her current venture, business has been good. She has plans to renovate and maybe add some Latino products to the mix. No me quejo, tengo buena venta aquí, pero quiero más. Where's her store exactly? She's in Jackson Heights on 37th Avenue. And um, one of the most interesting things about Digna, and I think a lot of the entrepreneurs that I spoke to, is their resilience. 
and the fact she's had a business twice in the past, it didn't work, and she was determined to set up shop in New York City. What were her previous businesses? Cigar shops. She had opened a cigar uh -huh. shop once in Glendale, Queens, and another time in Jackson Heights, and it was either the wrong business partner or the wrong location for the store, and but she was determined. I don't know that anybody can sell, make money selling tobacco anymore. That's exactly, know. yeah. So it's she not realized a growth that. industry anyway. Right. It's a shrinking <laughs> industry. She mentioned microloans. Right. And that was so interesting to me because, of course, the people who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, year before Al Gore, mm -hmm. were those who started uh, the contemporary microloan movement for the third world. But that's for peasants in India and Africa. We see these same kinds of microloans in Queens? Absolutely, and I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that microlending only happens in the developing world, and a lot of people don't realize that it's really a lifeline for immigrant businesses in New York City. Traditionally, because of credit issues like Digna and some of the other entrepreneurs that I feature on the site, you notice they either <coughs> don't have a strong credit history, they have a bad credit history, they've probably maxed out on credit cards, and traditional lenders don't take them, such as banks. Real quick, is there a solution to that, or is just this just the lot of immigrant businesses to go for microloans and loan sharks? Well, microlending is right now the biggest solution, and once somebody's able to pay off a microloan, it helps them establish their credit, and then they can actually get graduate, say, to a traditional lender. In the third world, we hear of microloans really being micro, $100. What are they in Jackson Heights, Queens? Well, they range from anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to maybe twenty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. They're, they're, they're loans that help you get a new awning or set up a, a, a new display case. This was part of your capstone project for your graduate school of journalism at CUNY degree. You graduated yesterday. Yes, we did. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank Good you. journalism. Thank you very Good much. Good luck to you. Coming up next, it's an underdeveloped area of Brooklyn, Gowanus, and its infamous canal. But what happens if Gowanus becomes Venice? For example, what happens to this Brooklyn business? Concrete, the stuff that New York City is built on. And that is just as true for the city's current building boom as it ever was. Between now and 2010, the city could add 3.5 million cubic yards of concrete. That's more than the amount of concrete poured into the main structure of the Hoover Dam. And those projections only include construction below Canal Street and major projects elsewhere. They don't account for concrete going into street repair or the countless smaller developments going up all over the city. Ferrara Brothers is one of the city's biggest concrete producers, pouring over half a million cubic yards of concrete each year. About half of that comes from their two Gowanus batching plants on the public place site, which the company stands to lose in the city's development plans. Ferrara Brothers says that would make it impossible for them to deliver concrete to Lower Manhattan, which could delay the $83 billion worth of construction projects slated for the area. Because although concrete is no longer just sand, stone, and cement, Today, concrete is also retarders, accelerators, and super plasticizers. It is polymerized and self-compacting. Nevertheless, concrete remains subject to the 90-minute rule. From mixed barrel to job site, a batch has only 90 minutes to be placed before it threatens to become unusable or set up on the truck. This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. We just saw that piece about the threatened concrete business in Gowanus, Brooklyn. We are joined now by Matt Sollers, CUNY reporter who made that video as part of an investigation of a Gowanus redevelopment battle. He is now a part-time video producer for the Wall Street Journal. Matt, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, talk about that business. It's such an old kind of business for New York these days. Yeah, concrete is really actually sort of fa fascinating and I feel like when I say that to people I'm telling them that uh, life insurance is fascinating and they just don't believe me but it actually is pretty fascinating and um, you know downtown Manhattan is going through a huge construction boom right now and uh, you know it's pretty amazing what what's going on down there so much of the city is so you would think that it would be boom times for the concrete business and yet you portray that one as threatened Right. The concrete industry is doing very, very well right now. Um, and the Ferrara Brothers company is doing well as well, but they're about to lose this plant, which uh, could 
pose some problems for development in lower Manhattan just because of the location. Right. So take us to Gowanus. There are people sure. watching right now from Queens and Staten Island and everywhere who've never actually been to Gowanus. Gowanus is um, a very, very industrial waterway. Um, there are bulkheads that are sort of eroding, falling into the water. Um, it's, it's sort of a lovely place if you really like industrial landscapes. Um, and there are some, there's some wildlife that's coming back there now. Um, wildlife? Uh, yeah, there's swans that are, that have taken up residence there, which is sort of inter interesting. And, um, there, I've heard reports that people are fishing there now. I don't, I hope they're not eating that fish, those fish, but they are fishing there. For and artists too. And of right. course, that other group that always is on the edge of gentrification in New York is the artist community. Many artists have found a home in Gowanus, so let's watch a few testimonials from Matt's piece about living in the area right now. Residential development of the Gowanus could affect one group more than any other, the area's thriving artist community. Artists have made the Gowanus home for decades, but in recent years, their numbers have risen rapidly, along with the rising cost for workspace in other parts of the city. Some of the artists who participated in this fall's annual Gowanus Artist Studio Tour, or Aghast, credited the canal's smells and contamination for keeping their neighborhood cheap. Timothy Brewer was one. He is a painter and a newcomer who began renting workspace on 4th Street in 2006 after being priced out of Manhattan. Occasionally, it does. The odor from the canal is a little foul smelling, but. Uh, it's what does it smell like? <laughs> what does it smell like? A sewer? <laughs> <laughs> now that the smells are less frequent and development seems like a foregone conclusion, the artists here take a sanguine view of the coming changes. David Lantau, the president of the Agas Tour, has been working and living in the Gowanus area for 18 years. I like, I like that neighborhood feel. I don't want it to mm -hmm. look like Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I understand why they're doing that. It's because, because, the, because the real estate market has, has pushed up so much. You, you know, to have something that's affordable, you have to be, build something big with lots of units. I understand that. It's like, that's, that's real estate. So, Matt, is what we see here a kind of strange alliance between avant-garde artists and the concrete industry? <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't go that far, but um, they, they have found a way to coexist, that's for sure. Um, and artists have always found a place on sort of the fringes of, of uh, New York City. Right, but what threatens them both as residents of Gowanus is gentrification. True, um, and there's really no way to clean up the waterway, it seems like, without gentrifying it. Um, it is a very polluted area of the city, so um, gentrifying is probably going to help the environment there, um, but certainly it will change the way um, it looks and, it, and the types of people that work and live there. So if Gowanus's reputation is for being kind of gritty, just how much is that going to turn around based on current development? Um, it's going to change quite a bit. Uh, there are developers there um, that have proposed development plans that fit within, you know, uh, rezoning proposals set out by the city that would have 12-story buildings with very high-end condos inside of them. Hmm. Um, Luxury condos in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Right. It uh, really is a new world. Yeah, you can open up your window and look out and see um, a junk, junkyard facility that's uh, shipping scrap metal to China. And gondolas on the canal or no? Well, there are people there that really look forward to taking that gondola ride at some point. So. so based on your reporting, have you come to a conclusion as to whether gentrification in Gowanus is a good thing because it cleans up a gritty neighborhood or a bad thing because it kicks out artists and concrete mixers? I think uh, it, it's a good thing. Certainly, it, it seems like the city needs to have concrete companies, and those, those guys are going to stay there. Just Couldn't they go somewhere else? Uh, they could, but you have to you have to pour concrete in 90 minutes, and to get to Lower Manhattan in 90 minutes, you really need to be a have access to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Right. Um, so you can't push them out to Central Jersey for the real estate prices. Yeah, it, yeah. It it makes it really tough to pour that concrete. By the way, those artists were actually pretty sanguine. They were like, "Don't take my cheap rent, stupid developer." They were like, "Yeah, things change." They, those were laid back. Uh, they were you know, very laid types. back. They were. Uh, I think they've been pushed out a lot of from a lot of other places in the city, so they're sort of used to it. Pioneer so, as lifestyle. Yeah. Thank right. you very much. Congratulations. Thank this you was also much. as a capstone project for your CUNY graduate degree. That's right. Which you have now earned and already working part-time at the Wall Street Journal That's right. on the video desk. Congratulations. Thank you.
Our society uses prison to punish people for their transgressions, obviously. But what happens after you serve that punishment? Well, in this country, a shocking 70% of the people who are released from prison each year will end up serving more time behind bars later. Let's watch a slideshow now, The Confessions of a Life Criminal Who Has Tried to Avoid the Revolving Door. I did 21 years in prison. Long time. I ain't trying to be no bad guy. It's just that that's the way I was. That's the way I thought. I was real crazy, doing a lot of robberies. I got to be known because of that. I was so addicted that them catching me one time, they stopped me, man. It was a point when I robbed somebody, got caught, let go. Robbed somebody again, got caught, let go. And then robbed somebody again on the same day, got caught. After being in jail, back to back to back to back to back to back to back, I got tired. I put a string up, put it around my neck, and jumped. I was diagnosed with um, bipolar, a bipolar medical depression. There's my medication. Yeah. I certified crazy, and I don't get Social Security. They denied me three times. I don't got no income. I don't get public assistance. I don't get Social Security, and I don't work. So basically, for four years, I've been homeless. I I hustle. You know what I mean? I'm a natural born hustler. And that's how I get by. You know? And I'm very, very good at it too. The funny part about it is I can work anytime I want to. I got a boss that'll hire me any day, but I'll be procrastinating. Is there a reason why you procrastinate? Drugs. Do you think that going into a drug treatment program might do anything for you? That's what I really, really I'm willing to do that, but these places don't take me, because <laughs> my mental health status is off the chain. It's high up there. It's like red alert. You ask me why am I um, procrastinating and all that? Because I don't have a foundation. You know what I mean? If I had a home, I wouldn't be fucking up like that. That interview is part of a piece put together by Ana Toro, who joins us now to talk about a portion of the population that most New Yorkers would rather not think about. Hi, Ana. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Guys like that. How'd you meet him? I met him on the train. I live in the Bronx, and I take the D train every day. And one time he got on, and he just started saying that he needed money, that he had just gotten out of prison. And uh, I, I and started you thought, I'm to doing him. a story on this guy. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> He was just uh, the kind of character that I knew uh, represented many people's situation. You know, meaning just came out of prison, not having a job, probably being unable to get a job because of his criminal record, and just, you know, being out and about hustling. You know, I mean, he says it in the piece that he's just, you know, trying to find all kinds of hustles to get by. And he's also trying to find uh, government funding mm -hmm. for his medication for his mental illness. Yes. That's not automatic when he gets out, assuming that he's poor enough for Medicaid? It is uh, in some cases. The situation with him is that uh, his, um, he has a drug problem. He's also, you know, mentally ill. And uh, some places will not take him because of his mental illness. Like, they will not give him drug treatment because his uh, mental illness is so bad. Also, it has to do with his own personal choice not to seek out, um, you know, different programs that, you know, that he might be eligible for. So social responsibility and yes. personal responsibility. Absolutely. Well, there are programs to help people reestablish an identity after prison. Let's take a look at one here. We're talking about breaking cycles. I talk to the participants on what validates them. Usually that determines, are you going to stay home? If it's the streets that validate you, then nine times out of ten, you're going to go back. National rate. Uh, people returning back to prison is at 7 out of 10. We broke that mold nationally, and we got guys going back at 4% rate. Because we talk about the contract, we talk about rites of passage, we talk about generational curses, we talk about employment, we talk about the spiritual peace, spirituality, family, and uh, community. And I think if you put all those things together and you work that in the contract, you have a greater success rate of not going back. Coming out, you know, people, uh, some people come out with hope, you know, and then they get discouraged 
because the minute they go for a job interview, the first thing people want to know is, why did you go to prison? Why did you go to jail? And then the minute that you tell them, then, you know, they change their colors. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Um, we're not hiring for this position now, but yet this is what you're advertising. If you want to see that whole piece, including the interactive parts, it's at my guest website, AnnaMarieToro.com. Uh, there was an interesting phrase in that piece, generational issues, or what did he say? Generational curses. Curses. What does that mean? Um, I think that what he means to say is that uh, uh, when you get caught up in this cycle of poverty, many times drug addiction and uh, incarceration, as a parent, it's very, very difficult to, for your children to get out of that. So, you know, just being involved in, um, you know, in, in that kind of activity, in those kinds of activities might lead your children to, to become involved in them as well. You know, I mean, if you, if your parents have been locked away or they have had drug issues and you grow up seeing that, it's a higher probability that you're going to end up in a situation. Sins of the fathers visited exactly. on the kids. Exactly. Well, that was an amazing success story if the numbers that they were citing are true. Mm -hmm. If the national recidivism rate is 70 percent, 70 percent of uh, people who get out of prison wind up back, yeah. and their recidivism rate is just 4 percent for people who've gone through that program, that's an incredible success. Actually, what he meant to say was that uh, it's 4%, uh, it's 40%, 4 out of 10, as opposed to uh, 7 out of 10. Okay. It's still half of uh, the national right. rate. Right, right. So what do you think it is? I think that what they do is uh, they address um, not just, for example, drug issues or, you know, getting you access to, uh, you know, to uh, city programs or, um, you know, things like that. I think that they really address you as a complete person. So they know that you need housing. They know that you know if you just come out of prison, you need a job. You also might have mental health issues that you haven't dealt with. Um, they they also realize that you might have a um, a spiritual hole that hasn't been filled. So as opposed to just focusing on one thing, you know, to make you to make you functional, they focus on you in a more holistic manner. And I think that uh, um, also the fact that many people who work at this program have been formerly incarcerated. So they're not, you know, let's say social workers with a graduate degree who have studied the issue but not really felt it People themselves. from the life. Exactly. Is that what drew you to this story? Or why this, out of all the things in the world that you could report on from New York? Was it to, to sound an alarm that some kind of change is needed at a policy level or what? Well, that was definitely uh, one uh, one of the things that drove me to you know to do such an such an extensive piece uh, you know on this issue. Another thing was that I, I have been uh, working in the criminal justice system for the past seven or eight years as an interpreter, and uh, I would just see the same guys over and over again. You know, and many times I would wonder why are they here? I mean, didn't they learn from their experiences in prison? I mean, like, w why would they want to go back? And uh, then when I started, you know, uh, reporting on these issues, I started to realize that it's a very complex uh, situation for them. That it's not just a matter of wanting to return to prison. It's that sometimes they just get caught up in this lifestyle and it's very easy to, you know, to break away from it. So one thing that you found on the topic of generational curses is programs for at-risk kids or kids whose parents are currently incarcerated. Mm -hmm. What do they do with kids whose parents are currently incarcerated? Um, they try to fill that hole. Um, if your mom is in jail, uh, who's going to take you to, um, I don't know, the, the high school dance? You know, who's going to talk to you about, uh, you know, a, a boyfriend or who's going to, you know, just mother you? So what they try to do is assign you mentors. So um, people who, you know, are from your background, from your neighborhood, and uh, they just try to take that place as much as they can. So uh, that way uh, the child doesn't feel like he's all alone or that the best thing for him to do is to turn to the streets. With your years in the criminal justice system and now doing this on the journalism level, if you could wave your magic wand, what's the first thing you would change? The first thing that I would change is people's perception of uh, the men and women who end up in a criminal justice system. It doesn't mean that uh, they are all bad. It means that sometimes they're bad guys by definition. They're the <laughs> ones who are robbing and stealing and stuff. And so, yes, that is what most people think, and that, that, that is you know partly right. However, um, sometimes it's poverty, sometimes it's illness, sometimes it's desperation, sometimes it's having mm -hmm. not having any other choice or any other opportunities. So that's one thing that I would like people to you know to realize that it's a very complex issue, and that uh, you know to just have an, uh, a more open mind. I mean, they are coming out eventually and that they're going to be joining your community at some point. Our community. Ana Marie Toro, you can see her website, AnnaMarieToro.com. She did that piece as a capstone project for her graduate school of journalism work 
at CUNY. Congratulations going Thank from you. the criminal justice system to the journalist justice system. Thank you very much for Thank joining you, us. Now, most of us do lots of shopping this holiday season, so let's take the opportunity to think about where all this stuff comes from and where it eventually gets dumped to begin this animated economics lesson. It's all about externalizing the costs. What that means is that the real costs of making stuff aren't captured in the price. In other words, we aren't paying for the stuff we buy. I was thinking about this the other day. I was walking to work and I wanted to listen to the news, so I popped into a radio shack to buy a radio. I found this cute little green radio for $4.99. I was standing there in line to buy this thing, and I was thinking, how could $4.99 possibly capture the cost of making this radio and getting it into my hands? The metal was probably mined in South Africa. The petroleum was probably drilled in Iraq. The plastics were probably produced in China. And maybe the whole thing was assembled by some 15-year-old in a maquiador in Mexico. $4.99 wouldn't even pay the rent for the shelf space it occupied until I came along, let alone part of the staff guy's salary who helped me pick it out, or the multiple ocean cruises and truck rides pieces of this radio went on. That's how I realized I didn't pay for the radio. So who did pay? Who indeed. Now a call in on the question, how do you balance holiday love and holiday stuff? 212-251-0801. You should see the number on your screen. 212-251-0801. And we want to hear from you now. To express more love, do you just buy more stuff? Is there any other way at Christmas time? What do you do to minimize the stuff while maximizing the love? 212-251-0801, You know, I know a guy who decided that this year he would give no Christmas presents, not even to his kids. Instead, he says he's educating his children about consumerism and they're making gifts or making donations for charities together. Is that too harsh for you? Is that Dad the Grinch? Or can you do that with the kids and have them come out the better for it without hating you? Have you ever done anything like that yourself? And what are you doing this year to maximize the love and minimize the stuff? 212-251-0801. And as your calls are coming in, we are joined on the phone by someone who has looked into the question of who really pays for super cheap products like that radio at Radio Shack. She is Annie Leonard, sustainable development expert and author of the animation we just saw, part of the story of stuff, and we'll see more in a minute. Hi, Annie. Oh, I have to do that to get Annie. Now you're on the air. Hi, Annie. Hi. I'm in New York. Where are you? I'm in Berkeley, California. Talking to me on a cell phone? No, I actually got a landline. You got a landline. And now, before we really talk, I would like to play a bit more of your story of stuff so people can see you. We'll see you in this. Also, you frame the question of sustainability really well. Do you have one of these? I got a little obsessed with mine. In fact, I got a little obsessed with all my stuff. Have you ever wondered where all the stuff we buy comes from and where it goes when we throw it out? I couldn't stop wondering about that, so I looked it up. And what the textbook said is that stuff moves through a system from extraction to production to distribution to consumption to disposal. All together, it's called the materials economy. Well, I looked into it a little bit more. In fact, I spent 10 years traveling the world, tracking where our stuff comes from and where it goes. And you know what I found out? That is not the whole story. There is a lot missing from this explanation. For one thing, this system looks like it's fine. No problem. But the truth is, it's a system in crisis. And the reason it's a system in crisis is it's a linear system and we live on a finite planet. And you cannot run a linear system on a finite planet indefinitely. Every step along the way, this system is interacting with the real world. In real life, it's not happening on a blank white page. It's interacting with societies, cultures, economies, the environment. And all along the way, it's bumping up against limits. Limits we don't see here because the diagram is incomplete. So let's go back through. Let's fill in some of the blanks and see what's missing. Well, one of the most important things that's missing is people. Yes, people. People live and work all along this system. And some people in this system matter a little more than others. Some have a little more say. 
All right, Annie Leonard, who's on the phone with us. Remember, the call-in question is, how do you balance your holiday love and your holiday stuff? Call us at 212-251-0801. 251-0801. How do you maximize the love and minimize the stuff? Can you do both things at the same time? 212-251-0801. Annie Leonard in California, can you? I do my best. How? Well, a couple of things. One is I, I try to get my spending or my giving in line with my priorities and my values. If I look at the things in my life, and, and, and lots of other people agree with this, they've seen it in a lot of studies, the things that really provide the greatest joy or fulfillment or happiness in life, it's not stuff. The things that really make life worth living are spending time with your kids, with your family, experiences, coming together with a group of people towards a shared goal. Yet even though statistic after statistic shows that's the biggest source of joy, so many of us are pouring all of our money and energy into just buying and maintaining and paying the bills for all this stuff. So the first step is to get, get your priorities in line with where you're putting your energy. So instead of going to work extra to buy a bunch of stuff, toxic containing stuff for my kid, I give her um, coupons for different experiences. We go on trips together. I actually give her, uh, she's only eight years old, I give her $100 to give away to charity so that she learns the joy of giving. That's great. Now I understand even though you live in California, you first really got into all this in New York, is that right? That's right. What, I were, went you, to, what were you I doing? I went to Barnard College, and my dorm was on 110th Street, and the main campus was on 116th, and every day I would walk up those blocks and see these, you know, shoulder-high piles of stuff on the street, of garbage. And, you know, month after month, I just started getting really curious and poking in there to see what was in there, and I saw that there was a lot of perfectly good stuff. So I got so intrigued by it that I took a class that included a field trip to Fresh Kills Landfill, you know, which many people say is the highest point on the eastern seaboard, along with the Great Wall of China, one of the few man-made structures you can see from space. And now closed, thankfully. Now closed. But I stood there at the end of this edge of this fresh fill, kills landfill, and as far as I could see was stuff. There were couches and refrigerators and loads of food and paper and clothes and shoes. And I just thought, oh, my God, we have a problem. We have built our society on this incredibly one-way, linear, wasteful system of just trashing materials, and it just can't be sustainable. And I understand that part of your expertise is the global angle on stuff. So when you saw that pile of stuff on Staten Island or on 110th Street, how does that relate to other countries? Well, I um, started working on the issue of garbage, and I thought that what we could do was encourage companies and cities and people to make less garbage by making it harder to get rid of it, by fighting landfills and incinerators. And what I didn't anticipate was that a lot of companies would simply send their stuff over to third world countries. So I spent over a decade following exports of waste from the world's richest countries, including the United States, to the world's poorest countries. I visited dumps in Haiti and Bangladesh and Indonesia full of garbage from the United States. Now, you stay there, Annie, for just a second. We're going to take a phone call here from Lori in Kensington, Brooklyn. Hi, Lori. You're on the air. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. So you have so, a way of maximizing love and minimizing stuff? Well, one thing I'm doing this year is I saved, uh, my, before my mother died a few years ago, her last hobby, really just a few weeks before she died, she learned how to do origami and we have I had a big box of paper with different color paper and so my niece who's now 10 and I are going to spend Saturday and we're going to make presents for her brother and her mother and her father with the same paper from the box of, of origami paper that might that's uh, great that's a good one definitely maximizes the love people love getting the handmade gift right that's right that's right and then just if I could say another thing I I really didn't have a lot of money this year to buy my team at work uh, presents, so I invited them over for lunch, and we had lunch together, and that was we had so much fun, and, and they all took pictures, and, and that was a great that was better than you didn't have the money, but luckily you had the time to make the origami, right? Right. Thanks a lot for joining us, and let's see, we have another caller, uh, Stephen on the Upper West Side. Hello, Stephen, you're on the air. Oh, am I in the air? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I was wondering if uh, you could talk about some environmentally friendly uh, gifts. For Whoops, I'm sorry. Environmentally friendly gifts what? And environmentally friendly 
environmentally friendly gifts for the holiday season. Um, I was wondering if maybe uh, you could talk. I'm, I'm looking for a gift for my wife, uh, maybe like an environmentally friendly dildo. Or All right. Well, <clears throat> they're out there. But uh, Annie Leonard, uh, let's take the first part of that question and talk about environmentally friendly gifts. If you are going to go to the store, then where do you start? I definitely think that you know not going to the store and giving the gift of time is a much more meaningful thing. But if you are going to shop, and, and you know shopping is fun, people are definitely not going to stop shopping. If we are going to shop, there are steps we can do to be more conscious consumers. We can buy local, locally made things from locally made stores to keep the money in the economy. We can look for toxics-free products, you know, avoid things like PVC and some of these super toxic materials. Um, we can also... Um, Sorry, I think I just lost you. Are you still there? Yeah, we're here. Oh, I'm sorry. I just heard a screeching noise. You didn't hear that? Sorry about that. No, that's anyway, you can look for um, fair trade certified or look for um, products that really perpetuate the kind of world we want to see. Think about the kind of world we want to see and think about do these purchases support us and move our economy into that direction or are they perpetuating a really toxics-based, you know, worker exploitative kind of system. But increasingly with the growing green market, there are lots and lots of organic, non-toxic, locally made, fair trade products available. All right. Annie Leonard from Marin, where I guess people screech. People don't screech in New York anymore. You know that. <laughs> Sorry, that was coming over the phone line. I didn't know what was going yeah, on. Yeah, Giuliani and Bloomberg wiped that out. Screeching is gone, and it's now a California thing. But uh, Annie Leonard from um, Free Range Productions, right? Free Range Studios are the people who made the film. Right. So that's people can look at your YouTube channel and see other things uh, from that Free Range Studios, more of your piece, that animation on stuff, and things like it. So thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for having me, and happy holidays. And we can take a few more of your phone calls on how you maximize the love and minimize the stuff at the holidays, 212-251-0801, 212-251-0801. Give us a call, and as you do, watch this classic riff on stuff from comedian George Carlin. I would have been out here a little bit sooner, but they gave me uh, the wrong dressing room, and I couldn't find any place to put my stuff. And I don't know how you are, but I need a place to put my stuff. So that's what I've been doing back there, just trying to find a place for my stuff. You know how important that is. That's the whole, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. Your house is just a place for your stuff. If you didn't have so much goddamn stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. That's all your house is, it's a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You see that when you take off in an airplane and you look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. Everybody's got their own pile of stuff. And when you leave your stuff, you gotta lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers. They're looking for the good stuff. That's all your house is. It's a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. All right. More and more stuff. George Collin with that classic riff on stuff. We have time for a few more phone calls tonight if you get them in really quick on what you do to maximize the love and minimize the stuff. You know, it's really funny. As you call 212-251-0801, people always say they're going to do it, and then they don't do it. And then there are just these handful of people out there who actually start to make things, who actually... How about that guy I mentioned before who said to his kids, no presents this year, no material gifts whatsoever. We're going to make donations to charities. We're going to create things for charities. Um, is, that, is that a Grinch of a dad, or is that somebody who's got the right idea? Could you stomach doing that with your own gifts and your own kids. Finally tonight, it's a Barney Cam Christmas at America's National Parks. Now, that's not Barney the Purple Dinosaur, it's Barney the Black Dog from a red state.
Barney, I love the outdoors, and there is nothing greater than our national parks. Did you know that the White House grounds are a national park? Sure are. One of almost 400 parks all over the country. Sure, Barney. You and Miss Beasley could be junior park rangers if you want to. But you're sure going to have to learn about the national parks if you want to be a junior park ranger. And Barney, if I'm not mistaken, you've already got a pretty big job to do right here at the White House with the Christmas decorations. you too. The Christmas decorations are coming along beautifully and you're way ahead of where you were last year. Hey Barney, did I hear you and Miss Beasley are trying to become junior park rangers? That's great. We love the national parks. Remember, I got engaged in one. Okay Barney, now you've gone country. Congratulations Barney and Miss Beasley on becoming junior park rangers. Well done. As someone born in Edinburgh, Scotland, it's always good to see the Scots doing well. And thankfully, that's the end of that. Believe it or not, that is part of an entire White House Barney Christmas series. Our next caller, Troy in St. George, Staten Island. Hi, Troy. You're on the air. How you doing, Brian? I love your show. Thank you. Good evening to you. Good evening. So? So this is what I, this is what I would do. I mean, people can donate their time to soup kitchens, donate, donate all these things within the community that they can help, and they can donate in somebody else's name. You don't necessarily need to give money, but if you give of your time to people and to organizations in other people's names, is that not a great gift? That is a great gift. Uh, although, you know, there's, a, there's actually a debate about that in etiquette land where some people say that it's not fair to the recipient to give a gift in their name kind of without their prior permission or acknowledgement. Well, Maybe they want hurt? stuff. I know a guy who, who gets disappointed when that happens. I don't know if it's because he doesn't get the stuff or if it's because he doesn't feel like he's necessarily signed off on the particular charity. What do you think about that? Well, you could always ask first, what's your favorite charity? Is there something in or around your neighborhood or your interest that I can donate my time to in your name? Not a bad idea. And you know what happens with donating time? Um, this is a good thing for everybody to keep in mind. There are so many people willing to work at soup kitchens on Thanksgiving Day and on Christmas Day. It's the rest of the year that they need people. So don't make it a one-day thing, folks. If you're going to volunteer, try to make it a recurring commitment. Of course Troy. Not. And you, you could always ask is it, you could always ask what the schedule is or what kind or what kind of activities are happening on a year-round basis because you can't give all your time on one day and give it to everybody else. You have to find you have to actually be genuine and donate your time in a very scheduled manner. So uh, if you're just going to do it on one day a year, you're not really doing gifts for everybody. You're doing one gift that you're going to give to everybody. That there, would be unfair. There you go. Troy, nice call. Thanks a lot. Good way to end the show. Merry Christmas to you and a happy Merry new year. Christmas. And that is it for tonight's show. We are here live Wednesday nights at 7.30 or as a podcast at CUNY.TV. And check out my daily radio show on WNYC tomorrow morning at 10. We'll talk about why gay teenagers are at increased risk of homelessness. That's the Brian Lehrer Show weekdays at 10 on WNYC AM 820 and 93.9 FM. Have a great night and everyone a very Merry Christmas.